Well, hello and welcome to Small Town Big Business, a podcast about doing big business in small town USA. I'm your host, Allison Hassler with Southern Illinois Vacation Rentals. And I'm Russell Williams. I'm director of Ethos. We're a small business incubator, co-working spaces, training and development here in downtown Marion. In fact, you're coming from the historic Citadel building on Tower Square Plaza. And we want to thank our sponsors for making the Small Town Big Business podcast possible. We want to thank Arcadia Wealth Group, Black Diamond Harley Davidson and RV, Fowler Heating and Cooling, Swinford Media Group, Watermark Auto Group Foundation, and of course our producers at Union Street Arts. Now, if you are new to the podcast, we thank you for joining us and we interview successful business owners in small towns to figure out what makes them thrive in small town USA. And today, our guest is Chris Dreyer with Rankings.io. Welcome, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having me, Allison and Russ. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. I am excited to learn about your business. We spoke very briefly on all the things that you're involved with, and you have a really robust history, it sounds like, here in Southern Illinois. So let's get started. So are you, are you from the area? I went to El Verado High School, so I am from the area. I actually lived in DeSoto, Illinois as well. And yeah, I've been here for a long time. I had uh, I moved away to Florida, I moved to St. Louis, and then I'm back after the first baby. Uh, I want to move closer to family, those permanent babysitters, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be back. Wonderful. All right. So, and tell us how you got yeah. started in this business, or any history in business before you got. You said you were kind of an entrepreneur before this business. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how deep you want me to go because we want I mean, you to go deep. Got a okay. history, huh? Well, when I went to college at SIU. I told my parents before I even went, I was like, I'm gonna go to college, I'm, I'm gonna do what you want me to do, but just so you know, I'm gonna start my own business. Yeah. And they're like, okay, we agree to that. And I ended up getting a job at Heron High School. I was their detention room teacher. Oh, that sounds the, like The fun. best job ever, right? <laughs> Good training for had, entrepreneurship. I had no power, right? The kids would act up, I'd send them to the principal, they would send them right back, uh -huh. so they knew that. And um, so, I had a good time. I had a great group of teachers and, that I worked with. And uh, fortunately, I had a lot of downtime. Mm. And I typed in the worst query ever online, how to make money online. Oh. <laughs> uh -huh. And I found Ed Dale's course to make your first $10 uh, with affiliate marketing. And by the end of my second year teaching, I was making about four times what I was my teacher salary. And it was wow. kind of a natural push to yeah. pursue this. So from there, I moved to Florida to get a mentor and it was really deep in digital marketing and dove into that and I had some ups and downs. For those in the SEO game, search engine optimization, there was an algorithm that came out around 2012 called the Penguin algorithm that basically penalized sites for uh, content that wasn't good enough. And mm. back then I was taking the short-term approach to you know quantitatively and not focused on qualitative mm -hmm. and well at the, let me back up i ranked number one for double chin for three years alcohol withdrawal for two years stain concrete for years um acai fruit you know when it hit the oprah uh oprah's you know channel so i had some sites that were ranking really well and it took my income from let's just say sixteen thousand a month down to about two overnight Mm. So the next question is like, well, how did you get into the agency space? Well, at the time I wasn't saving money investing. I was elevating my expenses and having a lot of fun with where I lived and travel. And so I, would, I had to, I had these expenses at the time. Craigslist was like where you went to get a job. Mm -hmm. So I went on there and I typed in SEO and I fired off my resume to, you know, so many companies I don't, I can't even tell you, I hit their filter where they wouldn't let me send anymore. Mm -hmm. And I actually got hired by three companies. And I know most of you, and maybe this, so there's differing perspectives on this. I actually accepted all three. One, because <laughs> they were all three remotes, yeah. but I had a team of, uh, that I had built from my affiliate marketing business. So I actually had three incomes coming. Yeah. And it's the classic story of the, the owners, I was in the mix 
-hmm. And I just felt I could do it better and wanted to do it myself in my own way. And then that's when I started rankings. At the time, it was attorneyrankings.org. Okay. So you bought the business? Yep. I bootstrapped it, $15,000 loan from my sister. Mm. And the rest is history. And it's it's been an evolution. It's been a lot of ups and downs. But the, the biggest thing I can tell you is focus. And there's a lot of surrounding words on mm. it, niching, you know, specializing. And that's, that's what I've done. I've just taken my focus to the next level. Yeah. Talk more about rankings. It's rankings.io yeah. because we're not familiar. Yeah, rankings.io, we help elite personal injury law firms with their search engine optimization. We do one thing for one group of individuals. Mm. That is niche. Very niche. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... We actually have a client here, uh, Lawler Brown, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we've you know we've got clients in St. Louis and uh, all over the country, and just we really like to work with hungry entrepreneurs and and personal injury law firms that are really looking to grow. Right. So, did this decision on the qualitative approach was that a direct result of the experience when uh, this Penguin SEO mm -hmm. came out? And how you articulately described your uh, <laughs> your lifestyle and right. expenses at the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I was not the, the saver of money or the investor. And basically what I mean by that is when I would target a keyword, let's say I wanted to rank for how to stain concrete floors, mm -hmm. I would have an article that really was basic and thin. I would yeah. hit the top level points, but I wouldn't go deep and really answer all of their intent and their needs. And so when it came around, when Google shifted to looking for quality, my articles need to be rewritten and I need to focus on obtain, you know, that expertise perspective. Yeah. And so a lot of times we talk about, is it quantity or quality? Like that, that binary, I'm not an or person. You'll hear, hear me say this a lot. I am an and person. It is quantity and quality. Mm -hmm. So it's more production focused on quality. And that's really when the shift happened. Yeah. Talk more about SEOs because may, people may not yeah. be familiar. So search engine optimization is getting a business to rank on the first page of Google for their primary keywords. Mm -hmm. For example, let's just stay in the legal because that's where I'm most familiar with. Mm -hmm. In St. Louis, there are many personal injury law firms. Mm -hmm. They all want car accidents, right? They want those cases. Mm -hmm. So if I can get the firm to rank number one for car accident lawyer, they have a better opportunity to obtain that consumer in that business. Right. Yeah. In these larger cities, there's substantially more competition, especially in the PI space compared to family law or trademark. You know, in trademark, you might be the only one in a city, and just by the nature of being the only one, you automatically rank. Yeah. When it comes to the billboard lawyers, that we're all getting bombarded with advertising. It's incredibly saturated and it demands ex expertise. Yeah. How long ago was that when you bought the company? So I, I started it, I bootstrapped it, and uh -huh. that was in 2013. Okay. When I started. And had you already started serving legal clients? At the agency I was at previously, they had many legal clients and I was their lead so you're person. You're familiar. Okay. And when I spoke to them, I had a non compete. I had all these things. And I said, look, I'm going to train the person to replace me. I'm going to be an ally. I'm going to be a referral partner, mm -hmm. advocate for you, and kind of went out that direction. But while I was in this business, I was getting LinkedIn recommendations. Mm -hmm. Now they were for my work at this company, but this, they were still my testimonials. So I was developing my social proof to, so that I had at least some proof that I could do the work when I moved into this, this area. I was, I was establishing processes and uh, figuring out my offers and all the startup business stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did that while working at a, at that agency. Wow. Very interesting. So what made you decide to move back to Southern Illinois? It's a good question. I, in Florida, I was being transparent. I was uh, partying a little too much. I remember my first week that I moved there, my roommates didn't know very many people. So well, what did I do? I went and I had a giant party. Um, so we had a DJ and we just invited all these people and 
my first week there, we got an eviction notice for noise, <laughs> so like a warning. And, but I say this, the relationships that I built there have lasted the entire time that I was in Florida. So when I moved back, mainly it was because I wanted to be closer to friends and family. Mm-hmm. I've got a really close friend who we're all acquainted with, Ryan Gadiski. He's the athletic director at Marion, a uh, phenomenal guy, phenomenal human. And I just want to be closer to family. I also, my, my mom was a, a cook. My dad was a mail carrier in Carbonell, and mm-hmm. I didn't want or expect them to have to travel to me every single year mm-hmm. in Florida. I wanted to make it easier for them, especially during the holidays. I moved back and I stayed in the Metro East and O'Fallon, you know, that mm-hmm. area for several years until we had our first son, Jenna, my wife and I had a gray Dean and I kind of whispered to her like, what do you think about moving back home? Mm. And she kind of just ran through the door with that. And before I knew it, I had a house bought in a, a month from then. And we bought a house close to Midland, Midland Inn and uh, mm. the rest is history. So that's kind of why is, is for family and being close to friends and family. Yeah. yeah. Having offices in Marion, was that strategic for you or what was the purpose? It was really strategic. I like to separate work and life, so to speak. Yeah. And now I am a workaholic and I, I do find myself looking at business things when I am around my family, but I like the disconnect. Mm-hmm. I found that when I work from home, I always felt like I was at work. I couldn't decompress and I needed to have a different space to go to. Yeah. yeah. And really collect my thoughts and and that's why I went to Marion and, and actually Ryan Gadiski was who found that spot for me. Okay, good. Yeah. How many employees? I believe we're up to 34 on the digital side, and then we've got about 70 contractors. Wow. Wow. So mm-hmm. are they all remote workers? Do they work around the United States? Are they are some local? All the full-time employees, except for two, are in the United States. We do have two from Pakistan that were from my affiliate days, and I have... Geez, there's several SIU employees. Matt Martin, who worked for the provost at SIU. Uh, He's now my chief of staff. I, uh, Stephen Willie, who worked for Gary Media, is now my president. And uh, he lives in over in Waterloo, but he went to SIU. We've got Chris Wisman. I don't know if you guys know Chris Wisman. He is my content editor. And uh, Eli uh, Fennell, he's he's our, uh, one of our SEO specials. So we do have some SIU talent. We are also starting to dip our toe in like the internship mm-hmm. side of things. But yeah, um, they're all remote. We really like to set them up for success. So we give them technology credits, a lot of training, things like that. Uh, make sure their their work environment is good. Some of them work at the co-working spaces mm-hmm. and some of them are very mobile. They'll work in a coffee shop and they mm-hmm. work in a library. And yeah. we, we allow those non-linear Work work days. Yeah, yeah. Have you found that to work well here in small town, Midwest, Marion, Illinois? I mean, what works and what? Yeah, the the biggest thing I can say as a leader, and I know that we talk briefly mm-hmm. about this, yeah. and your your association with John Maxwell yeah. is, I find that I'm focused on the outcome. I things like utilization and time tracking, I, I'm not a proponent for. Mm-hmm. It's if you're just punching a card, I don't want to penalize someone that can do the work more quickly because mm-hmm. they're efficient and better at their job. So yeah. I focus on the outcome and reward performance. And everyone has, especially when you work from home, whether it's you're a parent and you have your kids and like I, I, your hours are your hours. I'm just focused on the outcome. If you can do the job and you need to maybe put in a couple hours on a Saturday or shift your schedule around. That's okay. And it's the biggest thing is just transparency and communication and allowing that. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. So, um, how did you go from zero to one? And when I asked that is how did you go from knowing that you wanted to take on this business as your own, as Mm -hmm. far as the, the niche of attorney focused, SEO and rankings mm-hmm. uh, to having so many employees that are all over the world? It's a really good question. At the beginning, I focused on my sphere of influence, the individuals that I knew around me that could connect with people, and I did work for free. I worked for free and just provided so much value, eventually they would they wanted to pay me. 
That's how I got my early clientele, and that's how I got those testimonials. That's how I got those case studies. In the beginning, I worked for free. Then I started to establish myself with other agencies, and it's the classic. What are the clients that you don't want? I'll take them. What are the projects you don't want? So I really hustled. I remember I took on a 10 audit project. It was, it was awful. I still, it was, it took so much time and, but I did it and I paid back my sister that first year, uh, that 15,000 I owed her. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing from, let's say zero to 4 million was focusing on quality doing good work and referrals at about the 4 million mark. I realized that a lot of my referral partners now considered me a threat because I had money to advertise and compete against them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my referrals dried up. I even had a couple of my referral partners tell me that, Hey, my CEO said to not refer to you guys cause you're too good. And so the, when the referrals grew up, I had to generate my own business. And then we still get a lot of referrals today, but it's it's feast or famine in a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. So we had to just develop a brand and get really focused on marketing. Mm -hmm. And I like to say that the businesses that have a disproportionate number of sales and marketing employees have a better chance to succeed. And that's what we did. So, I mean, we can get really granular and tactical, but from let's say four to uh, four to six million, it was starting to generate, do our own SEO, do social media, do, let's say, a lot of ads, a lot of Facebook ads, Google ads. From eight to, we're on track for 12. Um, it's, it's just been doing more of that. So all of marketing, and this is a, what I like to say, is it, it's a linear equation for the most part. You do more cold calling, you're going to get more appointments. Do more email, you get more appointments. Do more SEO. You have more billboards. You do more TV. You're going to get more. It's it's linear equation. More inputs get more outputs. The non-linear equation is referrals. And one person they introduce you to two. Those introduce you. So it's focusing on the linear and the non-linear, which is and the non-linear comes from the experience, from doing good work, and it just compounds over time. It's like I said, I bootstrapped, so I didn't raise funds. I didn't raise capital and I had to take some learning lessons. I had some tough learning lessons and talk about those too. And uh, that's where, how I grew the agency. Yeah. And some of your marketing has been through Rolling Stone magazine, Ro Rolling Stone online, I guess. Yeah, we do a lot of content creation. We've got two podcasts. I contribute to Forbes, Rolling Stone, Newsweek, Fast Company, Biz Journals. We do. Can you put in a good word for small town, big yes. business? <laughs> yeah. Allison and I, maybe, you yeah. know, drop, there you some, go. drop Absolutely. some names. Appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs> what many people, and I didn't know this at the time, is I was a writer for Forbes because I was a part of their agency mm -hmm. council. And I just noticed that their profiles looked the same. Mm -hmm. I reached out to my point of contact and a main holding company owned Forbes, Rolling Stone, okay. Newsweek. Fast Company, Biz Journals, yeah. and I had this profile, I had this portfolio, and then that's how I got into those others. Mm -hmm. And it's just identifying commonalities, and I found that they had the same owner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's really interesting. So I would love to hear about a mistake that you made early on that you really learned from. Geez, so many mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> there was a big learning, a, a lot of growth around finances, and the bigger we get, the more important it is to be data oriented and forecasting. And I had a situation it was around 2018 where I overhired and it just completely drained my cash flow. So in year two of your it business? It was 2018. That was about oh, year 18. five okay. or so. I overhired and it just drained my cash flow, my profitability. I started to acquire debt. And that's the only point in time where we've carried debt. And I just had to grow up. I had to get better accounting, better processes around finances and forecasting and leading and lagging indicators, all those boring things that as an entrepreneur, I really didn't want to learn about. But at some point I had to and find the right people to, to take care of those initiatives for me. But that was a, a very big learning experience. In fact, there was a point in time where 
if the right or if, if, if something had happened and it went a little different, I could have probably went under or it had been really challenging to crawl out of it. But fortunately, we just kept pushing along and got more discipline and got out of that hole. Yeah. Other challenges you've had to grow this business, be successful? There's so many challenges every single day. I'm an avid reader. A lot of your books that are around here, I've I've read many of them. I've read 50 to 60 business books every year for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm really focused on compensation. Mm -hmm. I want to overcompensate my employees. I want to make sure I can retain top talent, develop them. Sales has been a huge learning experience in terms of strategies and, and your pitch and presentation and your follow-up and negotiation and closing. I would say right now, that's like a really big initiative for me yeah. to expand the sales force. And there's just every single day, there's something we had amazing retention for many, many years at the, at the first quarter of this year, we had a little bit more churn than normal. Like, why is this? So we had yeah. to do surveys to our clients and NPS studies and, determine why that was occurring and then fix those issues. It's a constant battle, but to me, I I tell everyone that I speak to about this, it's like a game. It's like a video game that pays me. I was really big into RPGs, Final Fantasy, Dungeons and Dragons, all these games, Dragon Mm -hmm. Warrior. And it's, you have this character that you develop and gain experience and you you earn coins and you, that's that's what business is. It's surrounding yourself with a good team, it's just a lot of fun, and that's that's where I get a lot of passion from. Yeah. Cool. So what exactly, I wanted to clarify something, what exactly was the original 15000 that you borrowed from your sister? What was that for? The original loan, I mm-hmm. went to the bank. I made my 30-page business plan. I don't, uh, I went and I presented it to the first bank I went to, and they're like, you know, probably dropped in the trash or looked at it for two seconds. They're like, we're going to give you five grand. And I was like really discouraged. And I'm like, I'm not taking a loan out for five grand. And the 15 K was like really a three month runway. I, I would highly advise most people to have a six way, six month runway. Fortunately in digital marketing game, anybody with a laptop can do services. And so my overhead costs were very low being a remote company kept them low. So it was a three-month runway. Fortunately, I got, you know, I covered my expenses that first month. I signed a couple clients, took on some terrible projects that I would never take on today to pay off the loan to my sister just because I didn't want to have that from a family perspective, even though it's not a ton of money. I just don't like borrowing money from friends or family. Sure. In fact, I even with my friends, I'll, I'll gift them. I'll say, hey, you know, whatever. I'm like, this is a gift. I don't expect you to repay it. This is a gift. And I have that mentality. That's what it was. It was a runway for three months of living expenses. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. What advice would you give for a startup that maybe right now they come to Ethos, small business incubator, and I say, well, I know Chris Dreyer. Chris Mm -hmm. is going to teach you something. What, What would you say? Focus on business development, marketing, and sales. Yeah. Chances are most people that start a business have that expertise from a technician perspective. You know, E-Myth Revisited, technician, manager, owner. Most of us know the craft. We we don't go into these areas where we don't know how to do the work. In terms of what advice I would give is just focus on marketing and sales. How are you going to generate business? Who's your sphere sphere of influence? Create a process to create new business every single day. Who are you going to have breakfast with? Network, you want to focus on leverage, leveraged activities. For example, if I go have breakfast with an individual, it's a one-to-one from a leverage perspective. If I'm on your podcast, how many subscribers and how many individuals do we have? Mm-hmm. Is the keynote presentation every time you do a podcast? Yes, it is. It's one of the reasons why I don't go to conferences. And a lot of my peers are like, why don't you go to conferences? Why don't you conf-? It's not worth my time. Mm-hmm. If I'm not speaking, it's not worth my time because I'm going to have these one-to-one relationships when I can do a podcast and my podcast gets 20,000 downloads a month. It, it's, it's a keynote every single time I do an episode. So it's focusing on leveraged activities to get in front of as many people as possible. Mm-hmm. So sponsorships, impressions is everything. And at the, at the beginning, you may not have the capital to do those leveraged activities. Mm-hmm. So you want to focus on those one-to-one. But in the future, that's where it's at. Mm-hmm. Really interesting. So what is your 
First, first of all, what is your favorite part of being an entrepreneur? What is your favorite part about your work? Mm-hmm. My favorite part is the sky's the limit of opportunities. I can really take any direction I want and pursue it if I have a passion for it. At other careers and other jobs I've had, I could be the best employee and I might get an incremental raise, but I was really limited and capped on, on my potential. And so I really like the ability to be flexible and, and, and try new things and, and just have that unlimited possibility. That's awesome. So what is your least favorite part about entrepreneurship or uh, your specific work, line of work? This is a tough one. My least favorite, I would say the finances. I, I really lean heavy on individuals and I just don't have a passion. I, I am the, if, you, if anybody does these DISC personality assessments, I'm a DI, I'm a driver influencer. I do not like details and I'm aware of that. So I surround myself that, with people that do like the details mm-hmm. and I like to move really quickly. The, the biggest frustration is, is I don't have patience. I'm yeah. like a huge driver. My family's like, oh, you're so impatient. My wife tells me I'm impatient all the time. And that, that's the biggest pain for me is when we can't move fast enough. Yeah. Does that work in small town? Because that's one of the things people think of small town, it's slow. Yeah. So people <laughs> like you, isn't it just frustrating just all the time? Or what's the advantage and have, and have you found support here in small town? The sky's the limit in any location. We're all sentients. We all have our phone nearby or in our pocket. Mm-hmm. And today, I like to say that businesses, it's, it's like running a lemonade stand where every business is on the same street. Mm-hmm. You have access to your phone. How is your lemonade stand different? Mm-hmm. If you own a restaurant, we can all see it. We can door dash in all these situations. Mm-hmm. You have to be different to stand out. I'm taking it back to the lemonade stand. One individual that has that classic lemonade stand versus the one that serves it at the car or has the frozen lemonade or, or different types of limits or maybe they have different payment processing methods or maybe their lemonade's green. You have to think of that when it, as it relates to your business. If you're just like every other business, you're a commodity. Mm-hmm. The problem with the commodity is you're evaluated based upon cost. Seth Godin says, if you're having a race to the bottom, you, you just don't want to win. Mm-hmm. So... Basically what it means by that is if you continue to lower your prices and you have no profit margin, you don't have a business. Mm -hmm. The way, a lot of times people think that's the first thing they do when they go to evaluate themselves versus their their competition. It's like, oh, he's charging $10 for a hamburger, I'm gonna charge nine. Mm -hmm. That's a very flawed mentality. A better mentality is to say, how can I make my sandwich better to charge $12? Mm -hmm. You see this a lot in our area right here, tons of fast food restaurants, mm-hmm. right? Tremendous competition, very convenient, very low margin. They have to get their margin through bundling mm-hmm. and, and these meals, these happy meals, they get their margin in soda, tremendous competition versus the high-end steak joint. High-end steak joint, tremendous margins, better quality of food, better experience, less competition, but most people don't think about that. Mm-hmm. The high-end steak joint actually has less competition than your standard McDonald's. Just a different way of looking at things, a different uh, form of perspective. But if you can be a person of value, Mm -hmm. value is everything. Yeah, it's good. That's really good. I love these gold nuggets that you've been giving us. Yeah, thank you. Is there anything else you wanted to share? I'm just excited to be here. I'm excited for the the opportunities of Southern Illinois. I was talking to Allison. I'm excited to maybe do some investment properties and yeah, I, I'm just excited to be here and, and contribute to the community and, um, and help any individual that I can. Well, speaking of which, mm-hmm. as an expert in your field, mm-hmm. what tips or advice without giving your secret sauce away, uh, what could you provide to a listener like me that maybe mm-hmm. has, you know, it has a, has a business, um, you know, maybe does a lot of in-house marketing or in-house SEO for their own website uh, or pays somebody outside of there to to run that for them. Um, what advice could you give them as an expert, a subject matter expert in your field? So much. The 
I would say just focus on leverage. And a lot of people, when they look at leverage, and we talked about it from a marketing perspective, the oldest form of leverage is I need someone to move the boulder. I need more people to move those boulders. You can get, get the rocks moved, right? Mm-hmm. And there are different forms of leverage. And, and you just, as much, the more leverage you have, the more you're capable of. So if you can hire a salesperson, maybe you don't have the revenue to pay them. Maybe you can get creative with your structure. Maybe it's commission only. Then you have someone that's constantly generating business for you. You have maybe a core competency and you have these high value activities and you can offload the things that you don't have passion about and get someone to project management or do those, do those tasks. We all have an hourly rate and we have to be aware of that. It's why a lot of times when we look at like mowing the yard, if, if you want to move slow, you do it yourself. And then just take the yard, for example, I got to go buy a lawnmower. I got to, figure out time to mow the grass. I got to figure out all these intricacies versus it, who, not how. It is finding and identifying a person that can just do it for me. It's exponential and fast. So I would just say focus on leverage and, and looking at leverage from all areas. Maybe it's talent. There's leverage and talent. Maybe you get an internship from SIU. So there's leverage, there's pricing arbitrage and hiring staff at a cheaper wage. It's it's. What are the activities that I can do that bring leverage to to my business? Yeah. Interesting. I like that. Chris, if someone wants to find you, learn more about your business, yeah. how can they get a, see something and learn? Yeah, the best way to connect with me is on LinkedIn. I, I connect, uh, accept all connection requests. And, and if they want to learn more about my business, if you're a personal injury attorney, mm-hmm. if you're a law firm listening, go to rankings.io. Okay, excellent. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. This is exciting. Yeah, this I've learned a lot. Awesome. I think this is really cool. Very niche business. I didn't know you existed here in Marin, Illinois. <laughs> and so a shout out again to Ryan Gudiski for making that introduction. Absolutely. That's awesome. So we've been with Chris Dreyer with Rankings.io. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We thank our sponsors and thank our viewing listeners for tuning in. Uh, and if you're a sponsor, thank you to Fowler Heating and Cooling, Arcadia Wealth Group, Black Diamond, Harley Davidson, and RV, Watermark Auto Group Foundation, Swinford Media Group, Union Street Arts, and of course, Southern Illinois Vacation Rentals, and Ethos Small Business Incubator. All right. And again, don't forget to subscribe. Remember, subscribing is free, and it will give you notifications of when we release new episodes every two weeks. And if you want to know more about Ethos, the small business incubator and co-working spaces, training and development here in downtown Marion, you can go to ethosmarion.org. You can reach out to me, Russell Williams, at russell at watermarkethos.org. Again, thank you for joining us. I'm Allison Hassler. And I'm Russ Williams.